And we're live. Great. Great. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for taking time in the middle of your very, very busy schedules to join us for an important uh, week of recognition of research, education, and innovation here at Children's National. I think um, during this, these crazy, unprecedented, and very different times, the value of science and discovery and new knowledge has never been so important. I am really, really proud to be able to kick off um, our research and education innovation week of 2020 um, with our nursing keynote speaker. Again, a very hearty and thankful, very grateful um, welcome to everyone who has been able to take some time out of the the daunting task of managing COVID-19 and um, take a break and, and join us here as we kick off this great celebration this week. It's my distinct honor then to um, introduce you to Dr. Pamela Hines. Dr. Hines is our endowed William and Joanne Conway endowed chair for nursing science. And she will do the, the honor of introducing our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Hines. Thank you so much for that, Linda. And I join you in warmly welcoming everyone internal to Children's National and external to Children's National to our 2020 Research, Education, and Innovation Week. And Linda and I would like to especially welcome Mrs. Nellie Robinson, who joins us today. She is our immediate past Chief Nurse Officer. Welcome, Nellie. And as Linda shared with you, I have the privilege of introducing you to Dr. Patty Brennan. And am I excited about her? Patty is the director of the National Library of Medicine. And Dr. Brennan comes to this role with a very wonderful background. And I'm gonna describe that background to you. And I'm gonna describe the NLM to you and why it is so important to us in this nation and to the globe. So I'll start with the National Library of Medicine or NLM. This is a part of our National Institutes of Health and it is the world's largest biomedical library and repository. And what I treasure about the NLM in addition to Dr. Brennan's leadership is that it is accessed by scientists, healthcare professionals, policymakers, and the lay public. It is available to all. Now, Dr. Brennan's background are three, actually, engineering systems, informatics, and direct care, including through nursing. And she has merged these various forms of expertise and innovation to lead not only the NLM in new strategic planning, but all of us into an expansion of data discovery that is directly linked to the health and well being of our nation and of other nations. Oh, I value that. Now, Dr. Brennan came to us from the University of Wisconsin Madison, where she held an endowed chair, and she was a professor in the School of Nursing and also in the College of Engineering. But in addition, she led this really innovative group that was named the Living Environments Laboratory. And they were all methodologists who got together periodically and really examined data using visualizations of these high dimensional data and worked on interpretations of these visualizations. How clever, all of that combined tells us why she is the director of the NLM. But in addition, Dr. Brennan has also been a past president of the American Medical Informa Informatics Association. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. She is a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing, and she is also a fellow in the New York Academy of Medicine. So today, Dr. Brennan, is going to walk us right into why precision health is evolving into precision artificial intelligence, why that transition is going to help us with future clinical decision-making and research. 
following her presentation and even during it, you will see at the bottom of your screen or even perhaps at the top, a tab that is labeled Q and A. Please won't you insert your questions into that tab throughout Dr. Brennan's presentation. I'll be looking for those and I shall pose those to Dr. Brennan uh, shortly after her presentation. And if you look inside the chat room, you will see an important message from Shadam Lloyd letting you know how to get continuing education credits for your participation today in this remarkable kickoff presentation of our 2020 REI week. And following our question and answer period, I'll be introducing Dr. Mark Badshaw, who is our physician in chief. He is our leader of the Children's Research Institute and our chief academic officer. And he will be offering us closing comments. So may I now go to Dr. Patty Brennan. And oh, Patty, we so warmly welcome you to being our kickoff presenter for 2020 REI. Dr. Brennan. Thank you so much, Pam. And thank you to all of you who've taken the time to spend the next hour with me. I hope that you are comfortable. I hope you're feeling energetic because this is an audience participation activity. So heads up. You may wanna get a pencil and some paper or have access to a different part of your computer where you can take some notes during this. I'm here today to talk with you about the vision of a future where precision health and artificial intelligence come together to make healthy AI. Now, I'm not at the beach as you see on the screen behind me. That happens to be the beautiful north coast of Taiwan where I got to spend some time last year. I'm actually in Philadelphia with my mom who's 90, who's pretty healthy, but the COVID-19 isolation was getting a little tough for her. So I'm here being back in my childhood in part but here to be with you this afternoon to talk about healthy AI and how we're going to go to a future where nursing can be supported and assisted by artificial intelligence. But it begins fundamentally and most importantly with knowing who we are as nurses and what we want to accomplish with our patients. It is also very largely driven by theories from informatics. You see on the screen in front of you there are five theoretical bases for informatics. First is knowledge formalization. Somehow going from the colloquial speech of everyday living to something that can be not only stored in a computer but operated on by computer algorithms requires that we translate the experience of everyday living into some structured manner. That's what we call knowledge formalization. Now, nursing has a bad rap with some of these. If I mention nursing diagnosis to you, I suspect some of your eyes will start spinning. What I want to talk to you today, though, about is formalization means making sure that what we experience with a patient is fairly represented in the computer representation of that patient. So it's not just matching words, but it's making sure the person in context is understood. We'll be coming back to that because this is one of the reasons why nursing is critical to making AI work for healthcare. Second, human computer behavior. The challenge in everyday use of technology is that the technology is ultimately brought into the patient's lives through a human agent. And there should be a partnership with the computer, with the analytic tools that are used to understand and make recommendations, and the person who's actually using it. Now, in this, as we say, again, unprecedented time, we're all using our computers way more than we ever anticipated and probably in ways we hadn't thought of. The behaviors that we're used to using or the manner in which our computers operate in the workplace is quite different than when they're in our homes. We might have to put up with different lighting or power cords that are too far away or screens that don't work quite as well. I find myself by the end of the day, my neck is killing me because I've been leaning the wrong way. Human computer behavior can be thought of as the glue that makes the knowledge of technology and the precisionness of the individual awake and alert and available to everyone. Another informatics theory that's important to be brought to bear here is cognition. Cognition is the way we formalize and think about the world. 
each of us thinks of cognition, each of us brings to cognition, the experience of self. So sometimes it's quite systematic. It is a formalization. We think in terms of words, but the ways of knowing and nursing also bring aesthetics, also bring ethics. We bring this intuitive sense of self into our cognitive experience of the patient. So as we build artificial intelligence tools to support nursing practice, to engage patients, to predict where the patient will be next, we need to remember that our understanding of the person is informed by all of these dimensions, which in turn must be translated into representations we can find in the computer. Using artificial intelligence tools to support practice requires that we rely on change theory. Change theory is the formal structure that we use to get us from point A to point B. We used to do it this way and now we do it that way. Change theory, the most important one for me, it comes from Kurt Lewin, that says first we have to go through an unfreezing, give up what we used to do, and then mobilization, and then a refreezing. So as we begin to use cognitive assistance from computers, such as artificial intelligence provides, we have to get ourselves through that process. What will we give up? What will we learn to do later? And I'll be talking more about that as we go through. And I want to make sure you jot down your thoughts about this as we go through, because this is perhaps the point where most nurses feel the greatest amount of uncertainty. How much will my practice change? And will I like what happens? This brings us to the last informatics theory that's important when we think about artificial intelligence and precision health. Systems theory. Most nurses operate as a part of a larger organization we're not on our own. We're not sculptors facing a piece of clay. We're not gardeners out in the backyard. We are in a system. So understanding how information and intelligence flows through a system is a critical aspect of making sure that AI tools can work for that system. Grounded in these five theory areas, I'm gonna walk you through precision health, artificial intelligence, and then what does the National Library of Medicine do to support making healthy AI serve the patients and the practitioners around the world? Take a look here at these various precision services, precision domains we see in health and, and human services, precision oncology, precision stomatology, precision nursing. What does this actually mean? Well, largely we're talking about a systematic approach to making sure that what must happen is what should happen and what does happen. Three aspects, what must happen, what should happen, and what does happen. We are precisely intervening. But in fact, what I want you to do is to move beyond thinking of precision in a narrow way and think broadly of precision health. How do we understand the person, what they need to do, what they would or could do for themselves if they had the strength, the will, or the ability? That's where nursing comes into the conversation of precision health. Now, take a look at this bullseye on the screen and look very carefully at the center of the bullseye. Feel yourself being pulled into that very center. Often when we speak about precision health, we speak about hitting the target, hitting the center, finding the exact right thing we need to have for this particular patient at this particular point in time in the manner in which this person responds. I want you to think about a couple of clinical cases with me for a few minutes so we can understand for the most part with, that precision health and precision AI fits into the life of a specific person. So first of all, precision screening, optimal diabetes mellitus screening protocol. What is the right way to figure out if a child or an adolescent is truly developing diabetes. So we have a case in front of us, a 16 year old woman, young woman, her first menstrual period was three years ago. She's been using birth control pills for two years. She has three positive second degree relations who have type two diabetes. She has a sedentary lifestyle, an impaired glucose tolerance test, a fasting blood sugar of 280, and a body mass index of 34. Now I suspect the wheels are turning already, but you might have gone quickly to what medication, what monitoring, what do we need to do? When we're going to establish screening protocols for a person, 
We have to think about a lot of uniqueness about that individual. We can use data mining to study across thousands of patients. What are the important relations here? And for an adolescent, it may be body image. For an adolescent, it may be peers. It may be food patterns. We, need, we can think about simulation tools to look at the policies and the capacities in a population. How many places are there in this community where someone can have an assessment for diabetes mellitus? How easy is it to get testing? How possible is it for a school health clinic, for example, or a local practitioner to be involved in the screening of this individual? In addition, optimization tools, which is a special part of mathematics and that we use in artificial intelligence, has a way to smartly choose among the thousands of possible pathways, what is the right one for this individual? Should we screen this young person twice a year, twice a month? Should they have uh, observation of their eating patterns? Should we be looking at other assessments? Creating the right protocol is what precision screening should be about, not determining which test must be done today, but in the process of screening, how do we bring it all together? Now let me bring another case to your attention. Precision therapies, how do we figure out how to target the proper treatment for an individual person? Genomics has given us a wide array of tools to understand exactly what mutation led to this particular manifestation in this particular person. That's opened up the opportunity to have many different discussions about the proper way to treat an individual. Here we have a young man seven years old, he's been diagnosed with leukemia. So those of you who are familiar with leukemia are probably wondering, well, which kind and how long and does a family member have it and what have you. We know things to help us understand that leukemia may vary based on the translocation which leads to the oncogenic fusion. Treatments that are specific to this, highly precise, may be best for this young person. Evidence-based decision-making might suggest that we have to make a determination between bone marrow transplant or, or chemotherapy intervention. But insurance co coverage might actually be the deciding point. What is feasible under this particular person's plan? And what is this patient's young man's preferences and assets? How do we understand how to precisely treat the presentation of leukemia that we're seeing in this young person? Precision therapeutics is an important part that precision medicine and precision health can help us with. But without nursing, we may become overly narrow in our precision. So now, here's our first audience participation activity. It's a self-reflection. We've just talked about two cases. I want you to take out your paper or to flip to your part in your computer where you can write, to write down five things you think we need to know about these two people to precisely care for them in the most proper way. Take a minute and jot them down. This won't be collected and it won't be graded. Nurses bring a special eye to the understanding of a patient's life. The ability to capture that eye and use it in our precision analytics will, to me, be the difference between making sure that a precise treatment actually works for an individual or the precise treatment may have been correct, but it doesn't always work because we haven't thought about what's important. So what was on your list of what nurses need to know to support precision health? Well, here's what was on my list. I wanted to know, is there a family support system in place? Does this young person have a, a, a pain management preference? That is, are, do they have a tolerance for pain, whether it's a needle stick or a prick or the bone marrow transplant, or do I have to work and help them become more tolerant of it? What is the body image of these two individuals? Because the way we approach the care of a person in part has to be engaging them and their whole self. So understanding their body image and their sense of well-being or wholeness or lack of wholeness because of disease process is critical. What is the living situation? Can I really count on therapeutics be, uh, being done in the home or do I have to make sure this person is brought to a safe place to administer treatment? 
And finally, how are these young people engaged in their ability to manage self-care? Can I really count on them doing what they need to do, whether it's monitoring a diet or looking at a wound and telling me how they're healing? The precision health for the patients that we care for must be informed by the knowledge that nursing has and what we are able to do. Now, how did my list compare to your list? Did you have similar things on there? Maybe you have a much deeper understanding of physiology than I do. Maybe you've cared for patients with cancer more, or you've done more, more work with adolescents, but each of us brings our knowledge. The challenge with artificial intelligence supportive practice is to find the right match of the knowledge of the person, the clinician, what they know about the patient, and the computational power of the analytics. But let's go back first and look at the bullseye. And remember, we're talking about precision health. But now, after this exercise, I want you to think of this not as a bullseye, but as the concentric description of an individual, from their cellular molecular level to an organ level, to the whole person, to the social, emotional, and physical environment where they live. When we bring these understandings of the person into context, we enhance the ability of precision therapeutics or precision screening protocols to actually work. Now we've spent time thinking about this and talking about this so far because I want you to, to remember that AI is not the magic bullet that is going to steamroll perfection into healthcare, but in fact, it is yet one of the other tools that we will be able to bring to our care processes. When I ask, bring this to you today, I ask you to think about what is needed for today's learning health system, which we all believe we're a part of, to really support precision health. And are we ready to do this? What we know is pay, people are complicated. Lives, cellular structures, disease processes are all different factors that have to be thought about together. To this point in time, to this point in history, the computational tools we've had to support our practice have been fairly limited. But with the emerging power of advanced computer systems and the ability of computers to gather and synthesize large amounts of data, it's possible that artificial intelligence will actually be the tool that allows us to bring together these important perspectives on an individual to help them become part of their life and help their therapeutics become more effective or help our diagnostic strategies become more efficient in ensuring their health. So what in fact is artificial intelligence? Take a minute and think about this. You don't have to write this one down. I just want you to think, of, what do you really think we're meaning when we say artificial intelligence? It's quite a buzzword. It sounds very impressive. And in fact, it's something that's been around for over 30 years. Artificial intelligence is really described in two fundamental ways. Artificial intelligence is the ability of the computer to act human or the ability of a computer to act as if human. And those are two different descriptions. I want to take a minute to ask you to, to reflect on this with me. When we have a computer that acts human, that computer reasoning, the computer logic, the, 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 if you will, the analytical process that is displayed by the computer matches what a human does. And often we ask it to see, well, what is the logic? How did the system get to that answer? What is the proof that that's the right answer? When an artificial intelligence program is built, for that, deter, that demonstrates a computer acting as if human, I'm oh, sorry, acting human, we should be able to see the same logical pathways. However, many artificial intelligence programs get to the same answer that a human would get to, but in a very different way, in a very different computational way, or thinking about very different elements or putting together a different sequence of events. That's when the computer acts as if human. It's a lot harder to explain the logic of a computer program, an AI recommending system, for example, when it acts as if human because the tools are not necessarily visible in quite the same way. The common tools we use for artificial intelligence you'll hear about are machine learning, natural language processing, neural networks, and deep learning. And we'll be seeing more of these tools develop over time. Machine learning is massive co simultaneous computations that occur Think about when an individual runs, how their many of their muscles, their tendons, their bone structure, their vessels 
all have to act together. Machine learning is the computational equivalent of showing how multiple aspects of the same phenomenon come to bear in a single function, say taking a step. Natural language processing is the, are the computational tools that, that allow a computer to understand human thought as expressed in natural terms. Neural network is a computational approach that was actually drawn on what we think actually goes on in the brain, but allows for levels of, of uh, associations to be made between phenomenon. Neural networks, frankly, re result in, the, in a uh, answer about how likely a person is to get cancer or when this person's uh, course of illness is going to change, but not using the same computational cognitive logic that a person uses, but rather achieving, reaching the same end by using, if you will, a data-driven approach. Deep learning is a computational strategy where multiple neural networks are built on top of each other, refining and learning each other. The computational tools that artificial intelligence use, use are often far beyond the understanding of anyone who actually uses AI products. The computational tools have the ability to deliver the answers we need, not necessarily showing us the reasoning that got to the answer. Let's take for a minute about looking to look at artificial intelligence in everyday living. I spy AI in everyday living. I want you to think about the number of times you've encountered AI in the last two days in your life. Here's a list of things that can rely on artificial intelligence algorithms. Self-driving cars, threat detection or fraud detection, financial fraud detection, video games, and advertising. Actually, all of these rely on artificial intelligence. If you bought a pair of shoes on Amazon today or last week, you were engaging with an artificial intelligence program. That program may have studied how long you've been on the computer that particular session, what color of shoes did you purchase, what purchases have you made in the past, and may have suggested other things for you. Sometimes the suggestions they make for me I find very surprising. I don't know how they ever got to that particular part of logic, but other times I find the recommendations actually make sense. Self-driving cars run on the ability to constantly sense and direct an object towards a particular motion. They are not thinking, but they are, have massive amounts of processing of sensing and response, of sensing and response that leads the car to stay on the road and to drive in a certain direction. Some believe even more safely than humans. Fraud detection and threat detection are analytical tools that go beyond the human power to reason, to begin to find minute shifts in patterns that may indicate that an error is taking place. For example, overbilling for a particular kind of medical care, or maybe a slight disruption in the, the bond market in the world suddenly going large. These algorithms are, have the capacity because of the computational ability expands far beyond what a human does to be able to act to be able to make recommendations, to be able to drive action. What we need in healthcare is the support of artificial intelligence to go forward to accomplish the work we need to accomplish. We certainly don't want it to take over for us. When we speak about artificial intelligence in healthcare, we, from the perspective of the National Library of Medicine, we believe first and foremost that AI will be good. We, it is possible to gain benefits from artificial intelligence far beyond what we could do without it. But the National Library of Medicine is here to make sure we do this in a way in partnerships with individuals, clinicians, and patients. Like this.
The National Library of Medicine realizes that clinicians are the link to patients and our artificial intelligence investments must support the human. Whether we're using the range of tools you see in front of you, these various computational strategies that become more and more precise within our artificial intelligence armamentum, or are making a recommendation for the next step of care for a person, whether or not this individual has pneumonia, should we give this particular medication? We believe that artificial intelligence can help clinicians practice better. We believe that artificial intelligence helps the learning health system move to the next level by first of all, gain, gaining and assisting in the analysis of these massive multidimensional data sets to really extract knowledge from practice, from what we know about family dynamics or movement, a person walking or the kind of response an individual has throughout their sleep-wake cycle. Artificial intelligence are, is useful because it incorporates experience for learning and judgments. The hallmark of an artificial intelligence system is that there is constant readjustment and relearning. That is, a process is, a recommendation is made, an action is taken, the consequence of the action are found, and then the system, the, the computation is revised based on that success or lack of success. Artificial intelligence can predict future, future disease likelihood. This is particularly important right now when we have so many subtle symptoms that are indicating whether or not a person actually has COVID-19 and we need to decide early on what kind of treatment should they get. That probabilistic reasoning coupled with good human judgment will make our care better. And we do know, and we have seen evidence that the use of artificial intelligence systems can improve both the accuracy and the prediction of health outcomes. But we know the clinician is at the end of the chain. We are there to support the clinician at the end of the AI chain. So we believe from the National Library of Medicine that clinicians have the right to assurances of transparency and trust. You must understand what the algorithm is recommending and to the extent possible, have the ability to trust that the recommendations are unbiased and are appropriate for the individual you're caring for. The clinician should be able to tailor early interventions individually to each patient, as opposed to forcing a standard in intervention on every person. The use of AI in, the cl in clinical care requires that we develop best practices to leverage AI for better decision-making. It's not appropriate everywhere. Sometimes it may take too long. Sometimes it may not be as transparent as needed. So it's not a cure for every problem. The clinician also has the ability to contribute significant data to refine algorithms. And again, that's a place where nursing comes in because we see things that are not seen by other disciplines because we can inform AI algorithms with new strategies and new information. We believe that healthy AI should be transparent and trustable for the clinicians. Clinicians are, clinical staff are making decisions with the health of AI, should be improving patient care, but it's important to make sure what information is, uh, is generated by an artificial intelligence algorithm and understand how it impacts a clinician. If it slows down the clinician's thought practice, if it makes it more difficult for care, then we should not be using these tools and we need to guard against that. In most cases, we've test that before they ever go into the field, but it's important to make sure we learn that these tools work. The goal is to improve the, patient's, the, the entire patient community's recognition that aided judgment will improve the care of an individual. We believe that the National Library of Medicine is best when we provide the tools that enhance information delivery at the point of care, that we promote access to research data, we bring knowledge from the point of care and send, sorry, bring data from the point of care and send knowledge back. We also conduct research to make sure the information that's collected is, at the point of care is used properly. And we help to prepare people for participating in data-driven care and science. The first I'd like to point out to you is the National Library of Medicine's responsibility is to, it's to effectively deliver information. The 21st century collection is going to be an interconnected web of literature, of data, of research findings. At the National Library of Medicine, we recognize our responsibilities to systematically 
preserve, collect, and discover the literature needed for practice. But doing that alone isn't enough. You can be overwhelmed with the number of tools the National Library of Medicine provides for you to help you, help you in your practice. What we also have to provide for you is the tools that make it easier to use information. And so we use artificial intelligence mechanisms to bring literature to the point of need. If you have not logged on to PubMed recently, you've not gotten an opportunity to see our new PubMed interface. PubMed has been, is a literature repository of citations. There's over 30 million articles in PubMed, 30 million citations for articles. We have two and a half million users every day carrying out three million searches, nine million page views, 30 million articles. We add a million new articles a year to PubMed. In the half an hour that we've been speaking, we've added 80 new articles and you're all behind. We've got the literature growing faster than the clinicians can use it. So let's think about how can AI help us with the literature? Imagine a future where AI will help you stay current with the literature. What could artificial intelligence do? What would an artificial intelligence literature assistant look like? Well, here's what I would like it to look like. I'd like to find the exact right paper quickly so that I didn't have to go searching around and reading six papers till I found the right one. I'd like an AI assistant to read my clinical notes concurrently and suggest appropriate references or point me to new guidelines. I'd like the, liter the understanding of my clinical documentation to generating a concept map that could then lead me to literature relevant to the case of this particular patient I was working on. And I'd actually like to have an AI assistant that would read papers for me and produce a one-page summary of multiple papers. What would you like an AI assistant to do for you with the literature? How can we be helpful to you? Take a minute and jot something down. Or take one of mine. I'll tell you what we are doing now. We're doing a much better job sorting the literature and getting the right information into your hands. If you've done a PubMed search in the past, you know we've always presented the literature to you in what we would call a reverse chronological order, most recent articles first. But now we've applied something called a learning to rank algorithms. When you make a search, your query, that's circle number one, gets translated into PubMed sequence. Of the 30 million citations that might be useful to you, we extract about five or 600 way too many for you to read, but then we apply this learning to rank algorithm, the triangles you see, to, to select which of these papers is the best match for the search term that you provided. That's pot number three. So we present to you on the first page the citations that are the best match for what you would need. This we find helps people because now often, most of the time when we return searches to people, we give more than one page, but nobody ever goes past the first page. Our learning to rank algorithm then learns from the experience that a searcher has. Did you click through to the next paper? Did you ignore the paper? That helps us refine this strategy. What you'll see now if you go to PubMed is the following. If you look at the top box, we see best matches for otitis media. You see the, the search phrases and the immediate collection connection to those articles. In the upper right-hand corner, you see an option, best match or most recent. We're looking at the best match options right now to make sure that as you look down, even though I searched for otitis media and it, and I, it found over 30,000 citations, that in fact, it gave me the top ones at the very top that would be the most relevant to me. In our new PubMed algorithm, we're also providing you with snippets at, when you select the particular article to get a couple of sentences to see what might be most useful to you. And in the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a slider bar that shows you how, by the height of the column, you know how much literature has been published in that area recently. NLM is working to, bring, to use artificial intelligence to bring you the best possible experience with looking at the literature. But we also are promoting access to research data and research resources. Through PubMed, which is our citation repository, and PubMed Central, which has our full text resource repository, we're now connecting to data, connected to articles, so that researchers can learn very quickly about new research findings and find additional information. 
in the last month, we've released over 40,000 full text machine readable articles through PubMed Central that now allow ex experts with experience in natural language processing to cull from the literature, basically to have the computers do the reading for them to find new and important relations. A lot of the work that's being done today on Remdesivir and the new studies that are being set up are driven by findings from the AI supported research findings. We have research uh, data link outs, as you see on the screen in front of you, that allow you to go directly to the data supported in each individual article. We also believe that having access to this data will improve the smartness of the AI algorithms. So data is one part of an artificial intelligence algorithm, but models are the second part. Models are the analytical tools, the pathway, the strategies used to bring the different elements of the data together. We're beginning to build a library of models that will describe the model by its type, purpose, assumption, use, and scale. That is, what is this model good for? The model that predicts a person who's at risk for falling is not gonna be the same computational model that predicts a person at risk for COVID-19. So we need to find ways to characterize these models. We also need to spend our time on model verification and validation making sure that the models actually perform the way we want them to. Now, I have another self-reflection exercise for you, so get ready. I want you to think about, from your experience with your patients, what would be the most relevant data to extract from the clinical record for powering AI alg alg algorithms to predict phenotypes, that is the human expression of genomic disorders. Think about it from your perspective for your patients, what is the data that are needed and where are those data sources? Beginning to understand how to acquire and present that data will help make sure that the experience of nurses caring for patients gets folded into our AI powered algorithms. In my case, I'm interested in things like family structure, daily variation in vital signs, laboratory values and functions. And they come from different places in the clinical record, the admission interview, the clinical flow sheets, the results summaries and the nursing observations. Helping our partners, our analytical partners who are building us the tools for decision support, know where to get the accurate data, the correct data is an important activity that nurses engage in. Now, when I speak about nursing practice, my guess is most of you thought about the clinical practice in the institution, in the care facility, the clinic, or the hospital where you are. And in fact, if you look at the screen in front of you, you'll see what looks like a typical year in the life of a person who gets care from a clinical care facility. In this case, we have someone has had a car accident on the far left-hand side. The x-ray reveals a fracture. There's a surgical repair and recovery happens. Discharge teaching happens in the center and the person is sent home on medications, does rehabilitation and has follow-up. This trajectory of care is very common in most healthcare organizations, but I want you to look very carefully at those thin little lines, because when we talk about patient care, patient decision-making and patient data, we're often thinking only about the points where the patient is engaging with us. Yet, we know that it is in the white spaces, in the care between the care where the patient experiences health and well-being. And if we're going to actually be able to improve using artificial intelligence, the care of our patients, we have to be able to extract relevant information, not only at the point of clinical care and encounter at the facility, but through the point of clinical living in the person's life. Part of the job of the National Library of Medicine is to bring data from the point of care and send knowledge back to the point of care. And yet we know we have a very large area to cover. We have to cover clinical care facilities as well as the everyday lives of individuals. And we also know that in many cases, these data are still stored in paper forms or in computer systems that don't talk to each other. So the National Library of Medicine is in part assisting and supporting the use of artificial intelligence tools, the building of artificial intelligence tools for practice by improving the standardization of clinical information, whether it comes from a device in the patient's home or a clinical care facility. We've been investing in the FHIR standard, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resource, to make sure that the data we need for 
patients, to describe patients' problems, to make them amenable to artificial intelligence is fair. That is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So part of what the National Library of Medicine does, I explained, is getting the literature available, making data sets available, but we also improve the ability of access to clinical information at the different areas of the, the care process. Just a couple more things, and then we'll move on to what the clinical condition considerations are. The National Library of Medicine is also interested in conducting research to use information collected at the point of care. A big part of this has to do with our support for clinical trials through our utility called clinicaltrials.gov. At the point of care, when patients are involved in clinical, clinical care with complex diseases, often enrolling in clinical trials better, helps to better understand the disease for the whole population. Clinicaltrials.gov is a registry of studies. You see on the screen on the upper left-hand corner our website. Here's an example of how you might find studies for cancer survivorship. Now, the data collected in clinical trials can power artificial intelligence algorithms. We don't use AI at this point, but let me walk you through these steps for just a moment. Patient who's curious about, is there a study for me? Can I participate in a study? Might go to clinicaltrials.gov to look for cancer survivorship studies, typing in the name, the words cancer survivorship into the search box. We do have an AI powered search engine that returns a list of studies relevant to that individual. And you'll notice here, these are studies that this person is, that are recruiting new people. The status is recruiting and they describe key aspects. Where, what is the nature of the study? What is the conditions being examined? Here's one for pediatric cancer and the cancer survivors datorship, survivorship database. They, where, if there's an intervention in the study and also where the, act, the study is actually going. Clinicaltrials.gov also supports cl artificial intelligence process by making sure the results of clinical studies are available quickly as possible. Within one year of a trial supported by the NIH, all of the results are available in a machine-readable format. What you see here on the screen is a comparison of 5-FU and Xelox in the treatment of patients with cancer. The description is here, what the patient, how it was delivered, and what we see in the lower part of the, the, the number of events that occurred. In this, in this particular case, it was days till complications appeared. The clinicaltrials.gov provides a foundation for understanding clinical trials and ensuring that we have data that can be brought to bear in, this, in the care of an individual. But we also are using artificial intelligence to begin to automatically match patients to trials so that the complex descriptions of clinical trials eligibility and the complex language in the clinical record can be mapped together and we can accelerate the participation of patients in clinical trials. We're trying to use artificial intelligence to make the National Library of Medicine better support the clinical practice environment. Another project that we're doing is to develop a time-dependent data repository. The patients experience healthcare problems over time. Gurgana Savova's group in Boston is trying to discover what the trajectory of care looks like by reading clinical notes by having a computer system read the clinical notes, understand and characterize the phenotype or recognize what the disorder is, and integrate patient episodes into an aggregate patient timeline. This use of artificial intelligence is moving our understanding of patients' care problems and, and care experiences from an individual moment to an integration across the time of the individual. We use artificial intelligence tools in lots of other ways. In some ways, we use them to actually help interpret research data. So now I'm going to give you a test. Are you better than an artificial intelligence algorithm? At this point in time, with working with patients with COVID-19, one of the most important challenges is to determine whether or not the patient has a bacterial or a viral pneumonia. Artificial intelligence tools are being built to help clinicians rapidly make this determination in the clinical area. Here's an example of what the AI system might be faced with. Here are three chest x-rays in front of you. I want you to take a look at them and see, can you tell which is normal lung tissue, which is viral pneumonia, and which represents a patient who's likely to have bacterial pneumonia? Now remember, the AI system is looking for features. It's looking for light and dark patterns. It's looking for 
proportion of the chest that's consumed by certain objects. It's looking for transparency. We don't always know all of the things that an AI program is looking at. If you're interested, the citation for this particular project is at the bottom. These slides will be available later. But take a look. Can you tell me which of these is a viral pneumonia, and which is a bacterial pneumonia? That would be important if the patient has COVID-19. Ready? Here we have the patient with viral pneumonias on the far right-hand side. And this is the most serious type of pneumonia we need to be able to detect quickly right now with COVID-19. AI programs are helping to detect this. In fact, the researchers at the National Library of Medicine are working on a lot of AI tools for diagnosis and practice, uh, for diagnosis and classification, including um, determining whether or not a patient is responding to malarial drugs, on the second line, measuring the extent of cardiac disease an individual has, de applying deep learning to determine how the, the extent of disease or non-disease present during colorectal screening, deep learning for cervical cancer screening, and age-related macular degeneration diagnosis and screening. In each of these cases, the algorithm actually outperforms the human judge because the algorithm, the AI algorithm, is attending to specific things in the image that the human eye may not be as, as experienced at understanding or interpreting. Now, you may be wondering, well, what does this mean for me as a nurse? I don't read x-rays every day. I don't do this kind of work. But in fact, nurses are involved in many cases. And in particular, I call your attention to the lower right-hand corner, deep learning for cervical cancer screening. Cervical cancer is one of the leading causes of death for women from 17 to 25 in low resourced areas and low income countries. And yet there are very few places that a young woman can go to get screening for cervical cancer. It's a fairly simple test of vinegar acid wash on the cervix and a, a visual exploration, but there's not a lot of skilled people who can do that. Yet, if we can develop an AI algorithm and embed that into a smartphone, and capture the image with a smartphone, we would be able to at least give a first pass diagnosis of is this woman at risk for cervical cancer while she's still in the clinic. So we would be able to start treatment faster. Tools like artificial intelligence will really help us change the way we interact with patients, provided the systems around us can support them. Now, AI is gonna bring lots of changes and one of the most important aspects of the process is going to be making sure we prepare people to participate in AI-supported care. So I'm going to finish our, my description of the National Library of Medicine and what we do, and then go on to what are some of the critical issues I think we should be trying to address. At this point in time, the National Library of Medicine is engaging the next generation of clinicians, librarians, nurses to promote data literacy to make sure that as these tools come into practice, people can begin to understand and use them in their care process. It's often hard to know exactly how to interpret an AI-based study different from a standard experimental design study. We've learned for years about how to read experimental designs, but artificial intelligence requires a new set of skills. We're trying to get out there and support people with new skills, new learning, and new resources. We're also working with the All of Us program you may have heard about, which is a new commitment by the National Institutes of Health to enroll a million people in a large data repository to be able to understand genomics, phenotypes, that is what is the, the physical consequence of the genomics, and health and behavior exposures. Bringing that massive amount of information together will be enhanced by artificial intelligence tools, yet explaining to patients what goes on with that is gonna be a little more complicated. So we've partnered with public libraries and local hospital libraries to, to develop patient-specific educational tools so that this complex approach to understanding health and well-being can be translated into terms that an individual patient can use and understand. Let me close with some of the key critical issues in AI-supported discovery and care. One of the very first ones is ensuring the rigor and reproducibility in laboratory and clinical investigations. Uh, artificial intelligence tools are only as good as the data that they are driven by. So we must make sure that these tools, that these studies that provide the data that go into AI algorithms actually are useful, are done well, and can be reproduced. That is done over again. It's important for us to be able to develop 
to a, a privacy preserving and, prov and trust and provenance in highly distributed information systems. When I showed you the timeline before of the care between the care and the white spots between care, we have data flowing from a number of different places. When we want to help with patients who are doing self-monitoring at home, we have to find ways to preserve the provenance, the trust to make sure the data are quality data and useful for them. We have placed, faced a challenge of finding robust biomedical and health information access methods and information dissemination methods. The information is coming at us so fast, we need new ways of looking. Reading papers, reading journal articles is only one way. We're looking at ways, experimenting with virtual reality and augmented reality, so information relevant to the point of care is visible at the point of care, such as the nutritional label hovering over the box of orange juice, the carton of orange juice in the second picture from the left, or the laboratory scientists using AI to plan effectively how to do studies. But we fundamentally recognize that the information tools that provide decision support have to be built into the clinical workway in a way that complements human cognition, whether it's the dad at home, the first responder, or the critical care unit. We cannot disrupt the care process as we're trying to help the care process. And finally, we face some information engineering challenges that might not be as familiar to all of you, but matter a lot to us at librarians. How do we curate information, make sure it's good high quality at very fast scale? What do we do with millions of molecular measurements of an individual? Which pay, do we pay the most attention to? How do we not over uh, calibrate to an individual's normal variation? And how do we have the right tools and analytics to make information truly useful? I close by telling you that you may believe the National Library of Medicine is and will continue to serve as a trusted partner in AI-powered care and AI-supported health. That precision health brings the opportunity to ensure that a person in context receives the best recommendations, the strategies most likely to support their care and has the best chance of health and well-being. I thank you for your time. I hope this hour has been of interest to you, and here's how you can reach me. Thank you very much. Okay. Dr. Brennan, this is Pam. Thank you so very much for a spectacular presentation. I really enjoyed the reflections. May I take you to the first question? And I'm going to combine several questions um, in consideration of time. Could you share with us the strategies being used perhaps behind the scenes, to control for bias in any of the AI approaches and even the algorithms that are resulting? This is very, very important question. And it's actually a question I would expect every professional to be keep to the top of their list of questions to ask. Um, bias can be introduced in many ways. Sometimes bias comes from the fact that our sampling approaches for studies do not recruit a large enough population or do not recruit a diverse enough populations. That we call population bias. And that's a matter of making sure that the studies that individuals carry out, in fact, draw from the proper populations. For example, right now, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease is conducting a 10,000 person sample of serology for the COVID-19 epidemic, and they have a highly, highly structured way of making sure that that sample will be representative mm -hmm. so we can draw uh, good conclusions from it. But I'll bet what you're asking more about is, will the algorithm lead me to favor one group over another, maybe privilege medication over a non-surgical treatment, or maybe even just introduce its own bias of what, what works with wealthy people, not necessarily works with all populations. In order to do that, we, if, you, if you remember back to the slide I had about models, we are constantly looking for evidence to validate and verify that our algorithms are working as we expect them to work, that there is no uh, overshadowing or no implicit creep towards a particular strategy without good evidence that that is the strategy. Mm -hmm. So it requires a series of in the moment tests and periodic recalibration of the AI system. Importantly, we just met today at the National Library of Medicine to make sure that our strategy for bringing the, the COVID-19 literature to the community 
is free of bias because we must be sure that we're not simply only taking studies from North America or only from studies from uh, that were done with with people under the age of 50. So we we do recognize there are many many ways to we have, that we have to use to show what we refer to as the integrity of the algorithm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brennan, and and I will send you the rest of the questions. But may I now welcome Dr. Batchoff to offer closing comments? Thank you. First of all, I I can't think of a better way of having start our our REI week because. You spoke of research, education, innovation, and clinical care, which is everything that we do, basically, and uh, did it so beautifully. So thank you so much. The second thank you is uh, to almost our 2,000 nurses at Children's National, because when our children leave the hospital, they and their parents, the things that, that they remember most are the nurse who cared for them. And it's this combination of the nurses' personal care and our ability now to bring informatics and uh, digital technology and uh, telehealth to the care of children that I really think is going to transform medicine. And I think the one silver lining, if there is one, to, to uh, COVID is that I think it's going to bring this transformation uh, more rapidly than it would have without that. And so thank you so much, Dr. Brennan, for being at the forefront of this field and leading us forward. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for all that everyone in your system is doing for every patient. COVID-19 patients, young people, their families, their parents, their friends, thank you very much. The care of nurses is what makes the care of the country so great. Thank you. And goodbye, everyone. We hope to see you tomorrow for our next two research education innovation lectures at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Catherine High is going to speak to us. She is uh, one of the pioneers in uh, human gene therapy. And at noontime, Dan Geshwin from UCLA will be speaking to us about autism. Hope to see you there. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.